I was a friend of Feynman early in his life. I was a student at Cornell and he was a young professor and we got to be friends. But that was a time of his life at which he, he, he was suffering. He was, it was, of course, he, he loved to be a joker. He, he was, he's famous for his high spirits, his wonderful drum performances. He was a performer who loved to play for the crowd. At the time I knew him, at that, this was 1947, 48, just after the war, the, 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 the Second World War, as we old timers call it, the, uh, I, show, I saw the grim side of Feynman. He, was, he had been through hell in all kinds of ways. First of all, his first wife, Arlene, to whom he was always devoted. She was dying of tuberculosis when they were married. He nursed her to her death for a year and a half. And that had made the universe dark for him for quite a while. He was also fresh from Los Alamos. He had, uh, in Los Alamos, he went with mixed feelings to build bombs. He decided to go because he was afraid of Hitler getting the bomb first. And then he found out when he got there that he was actually too good at that game. He really enjoyed building bombs and that worried him seriously. He was all his life, he regretted that in a way, that, that they had continued playing the game. They were so good at playing at this game of building bombs. They continued even after Hitler dropped out. I remember when I knew him best, this was in the summer of 1948. He invited me to travel with him from Cleveland to Albuquerque, that's about a three-day drive. He asked me to go along just to keep him company. It was a wonderful time, of course, to have Feynman to yourself for three days. But it was also grim. He was, every time we came to a construction site, he would say, why did he do that? They know it'll all be destroyed by bombs very soon. He had, he had a grim view of the future he said, we're not going to get away with it just to, f we brought bombs into the world. We're, we're, we're going to suffer just like the Japanese. He had uh, one good friend at Los Alamos who actually quit. That was Joseph, Ros Joseph Rotblat, who happened to be a, a Polish, but was also working at Los Alamos as part of the British delegation. And Rotblatt was the one who, who quit when it became known that the Germans had dropped out. Rotblatt just said, I will not do any more of this. And Feynman regretted that that was not him. He made his, uh, 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 a resolution at the time the, came, the war came to an end after Hiroshima. Dick decided he will never do any kind of secret work in his, uh, the rest of his life. And he kept to that. He never worked again on secrets. He never worked on any kind of military pro pro projects. At the end of his life, there came the Challenger disaster when the shuttle Challenger blew up. And that was in fact just a year before Richard died but they asked Richard to be on the Commission of Inquiry to, to investigate the causes of the disaster. And that, that, that Richard knew that he had very short time still to live. He had already had two major cancer operations, so he knew his days were numbered. But he still said yes to that invitation. He felt it was his duty he was an honest scientist who, 
he, he knew could do better than the bureaucrats understanding the causes. So he took the job and he spent most of the rest of his life actually at meet, meetings of, of the Challenger Inquiry. And he did in, form his own opinions. The, the, the commission wrote a report essentially saying nobody was to blame. It was just an accident and too bad, but no, nobody should be blamed for it. Dick refused to sign that report. He wrote a re minority report of his own, which in fact was added just as an appendix to the re report of the commission, which was in, uh, from a point of view of reaching the public, of course, that <laughs> was a great piece of luck because Richard's appendix got far more attention from the public than the majority view. Richard went around, the way he studied the problem was, he went around talking to the people involved and he discovered that the basic cause of the accident was the existence of two separate cultures, two separate groups of people who were not talking the same language and were not talking to each other. The two groups were the managers, the people at, in Washington who actually made decisions about sh shuttle missions. And there were the engineers, the people who actually understood what was going on when a rocket fires, the people who knew what the risks actually were. And he asked each of these views of pe each of these groups of people what was the chance of a fatal accident? And the results were drastically different. When he asked the engineers who actually knew what was going on, they said, oh, about one in a hundred. That was a majority of the engineers. They were pretty close to one in a hundred. That was a, a reasonable guess if you looked at the details, what might go wrong. It happened that the day of the launch, the weather was unusually cold. And that was a strong reason for postponing the launch. The engineers knew that the safety of the mission actually depended on rubber O-rings, which separated the segments of the, 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 the side boosters, which boosted the first stage of the rocket. So these side boosters were burning inside. They were solid fuel rockets. And this burning, blazing rocket fuel could leak out through the O-rings if the O-rings were stiff. And if the O-rings were not flexible, there would be gaps and the, the, the hot gases would come, come blazing out of the, through, through, the, through the gaps and, then, and, and, and could in fact burn their way through the main body of the rocket and make the whole thing explode, which is what actually happened. The engineers were, anew, were, were aware of this risk and strongly advised against the launch. The managers said, sorry, but we have to, do, we have to go and there's very small chance of an accident anyway. It happened that public relations were really the concern of the managers. That this flight had on board a, a, a school teacher, a, a, McAuliffe, who was a very brave soul, who went up on the shuttle in order to talk to her kids from space. It was a very good idea that she should do that, that she should from space should tell the kids how the universe looked from up there, how the Earth looked, and give them a feeling for what space really was. So she was all ready to do that job. And the managers at NASA considered that from the point of view of public relations, this was so important, it should override the technical judgment of the engineers. So the disasters happened. And Richard wrote his minority report explaining how that happened. And he, ending with this famous conclusion that nature cannot be fooled. Public relations should never supersede engineering judgment because nature cannot be fooled.
After that, that was the end of Feynman's life, but I wanted to talk just for the last few minutes about the future and Feynman's view of the future. He said, there's plenty of room at the bottom. That was one of his famous statements. And he meant that the way to explore nature was miniaturization, that uh, if, you, if you look at the instruments with which we explore nature, that in fact they get better and better as they get smaller and smaller. That's been true, of course, of many fields of science. And it happened that he, he had three, in, uh, Dick, Dick at the, uh, in his later life had, had three actual uh, uh, good friends and interests. There, there was Marvin Minsky, who was an expert on com uh, computing and artificial intelligence. There was Danny Hillis, who, who uh, was the inventor of parallel computing, which meant sort of making the processes smaller and smaller and more and more numerous. And in that, in, in, your computing power then goes up very rapidly as you make them smaller. And Feynman himself also was interested in molecular biology. He actually worked as an experimenter for a while just to get a feeling for bi biological experiments. He never became a biologist, but he, he wanted to get at least to get his hands dirty in the, in, in the lab. And so he understood what you could actually do with molecular biology, which is, of course, nature's way of miniaturization. So he saw miniaturization as the key to the future. And one of the outcomes of this was a scheme which I've been promoting. I, it, it, we didn't use that name, but we were talking about that when, when, when we talked about the future. It is the, 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 uh, uh, a thing which I think will exist in about 100 years called a Noah's Ark egg. A Noah's Ark egg is sort of bringing miniaturization to the ultimate as far as we know how using biology. And so the idea of a new Noah's Ark egg is it's an object about a kilometer in weight. It looks like an ostrich egg. Only instead of having just one bird come out of it, you have a whole ecology of a whole planet. The way you do that, of course, is it, 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 it contains a couple of million species and humans, each represented by an embryo. So or with, in the case of the non-human species, you have two embryos. They, they came down the, 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 the gangway two by two. And the humans, of course, come separately. But if you do the calculation, if you take the, the size of an embryo and the amount of life support it will actually need to make the trip and the apparatus that's needed to bring it from the inside of the egg to the outside, and put all of it all together, it adds up. And you find that to transport the embryonic form of life for a couple of million species to make an entire ecology for a, for a living planet, it takes about a kilogram and it takes about $10 million. So it's cheap and it could be done and it could be done on a massive scale. And I think it will be done. So that's what I see as the fulfillment of, of, of Dick's statement. There's plenty of room at the bottom. You can imagine that there, in a hundred years or so, we will have understood the science of embryology, and the science of evolution, and the, 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 the science of ecology well enough to design the whole system. And there's a little bit of a problem when the babies are delivered on the planet in the form of embryos. How do you bring up a child without parents? Well, that's a little bit of a problem. But you have robotic nannies which can do the physical job of take, taking care of a baby and washing the diapers and so forth. So robotic nannies are part of the solution. 
the other part of the solution is the parents. The parents are still in touch. They are left behind on the, uh, left behind on the earth, but they are by high, high, by high bandwidth communication, they're only a few hours away. So you have your planets, you have your parents close by, not physically, but, but by communication. So your parents are there giving you help and advice. So anyhow, that's the future I look forward to and that <laughs> what causes me not to take such, such a grim view of the world as Dick did when I knew him. Thank you.